much to our speakers for three excellent talks to open this seminar. Um, I'm going to invite the three panel speakers to join us. And I'm going to invite the audience to raise their hands. If they have questions, please indicate to whom you would like your question addressed. And please keep all questions as short as possible so that everyone gets a chance. Um, thank you very much. And when you are speaking, unmute yourself and please remember to mute yourself after your question. Um, so thank you very much. What we've had is a wide range of presentations. We have Teresa on the one hand presenting the Research Ethics Committee challenges from the South African perspective, and we had uh, Francis and Tiwange reflecting on the, the challenges that they experienced in the Malawian context. And of course, we also had Professor Brian Orwood giving us the researcher perspective in terms of challenges experienced during the uh, pandemic. So uh, Tiwange, Brian and uh, Francis, if you would like to switch on your videos, please go ahead. And we have a first question from Richard Naidu. So Richard, would you like to go ahead with your question? Please unmute. Thank you, good morning. Can you hear me clearly? We can. Okay, great. So my question is for any of the presenters. I just needed to, I want you to know what is their ethical standpoint regarding um, individuals wanting to take medication that has not been uh, clinically or scientifically approved or any herbal medication. I want to know what, what your personal opinion is on this and what's your ethical standpoint. Thanks. You're muted. Brian, would you like to start with that question? <laughs> did, I, <laughs> did I draw the short straw? Um, <laughs> I mean, you could ask the same question about what about cigarette smoking? You know, do should we allow people to ethically smoke cigarettes? We know it's uh, uh, not, you know, uh, maybe I've got a bit of a pragmatic view. Uh, I, I think, you know, people can take what they want to. Um, I, I, I think when somebody wants to take ivermectin, we know like, as a medical community, we're not convinced it works at all, but if they want to take it, they can take it. You know, it's, I think what becomes difficult is when people force doctors, as there have been a couple of things in, in the press, when patients are forcing doctors to use medications they don't believe in. So if you sitting, if you are um, on your, as your own private person and you decide that ivermectin or, um, I'm going to pick any drug off the shelf that you decide, vitamin C, high dose vitamin C, if you think that that is fine. I, I personally don't, um, uh, you know, I don't, I, I can't see a good reason to actually ethically stop people. Yes, it's off label use and people need to concede that. Um, I think the the, the uh, SAPRA or the regulatory bodies might have a bit of a problem with it. Um, you know, but the reality is people take all sorts of things, homeopathic medication, people have smoked ARVs for various indications. And I don't know that we can really, really stop people doing what they really believe in and what they think is best. What I think we are obliged to do is to try and um, correct people's misconceptions and, and, and again, um, I think Teresa was very spot on that there's a mistrust of the medical community, particularly in this country, a mistrust of science in this community, particularly in this country. And I think that we, we need to do lots to actually try and redress that. And and I think, um, you know, there's only so much. I tell my patients every day is that when I was previously a pulmonologist, not to smoke, but they still smoke, you know. So that's that's my own pragmatic view. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Teresa and Francis, would you like to weigh in there? Um, yeah, so, so, so thank you. I think it is a challenging question and uh, I really concur with, with Brian's thoughts. But I think as as health professionals, we always tend to view things with a with an evidence-based lens. Um, and I think Brian's emphasis on, on trying to inform, trying to build trust, um, trying to, to really build 
understanding of why evidence based practices is, is needed, especially, you know, as you said, you can apply to anything. But for, for COVID 19, I think it, it is particularly important because a lot of these debates are being played out on social media. Um, this tends to influence. Um, you know how, how people react and, and, and the choices that, that they make. I think also ju just to say that just to say that a pandemic really does equalize the, the playing field. So I think just to sort of bring it back to, to what, what we had identified in, in our research is that you know the the dual role of and sometimes triple role of of research ethics um, committee members and and colleagues actually becomes quite um, challenging. So you you know you you have your perspectives as a clinician and as a frontline worker. Um, you have your perspectives as a research ethicist, and then you have your your perspectives as a as a as a family member, as maybe a, a mother, a, um, a father, a daughter, you know whatever it might be, you know to your your family, to your community who is being affected by the pandemic, to, to your own experiences, your own fears. And, and so I, I think it, it is a challenge to to really weigh all of those up. And I think if we are perhaps mindful of those those different roles, we can perhaps understand perspectives a little bit more and really try and, and build trust. Thanks. So just just one one more comment from my side. Um, I think there's a difference between um, condo like allowing medications that don't work as opposed to allowing medications that are harmful. Um, if something is shown to be harmful, then I think there's a much stronger, uh, you have to as a, as, a, as a physician have a much stronger approach. Um, but if something has just been shown not to work, um, then, I, then I feel pretty, uh, pretty neutral about these kinds of things. Uh, Virginia Swigenthal, it's your turn next. Richard, would you, if your if your question is answered, could you please put your hand down? Sorry about that. Thank, about you. Thank you. Virginia, go ahead. I don't know, if, Virginia, if you can hear me. OK, so while we're waiting for other questions, I'm just going to uh, go on with the uh, uh, take up the question that came up during the panel discussion in terms of waivers of consent. So, uh, Teresa, um, you mentioned it. Francis mentioned it. Brian mentioned it from his side as well. I think, do we need to go into a little bit of discussion around that? It was one of the most difficult challenges researchers and research ethics committees faced during the pandemic. Yes, so, so absolutely. As, as, as Brian said, I feel like I've drawn the, the short straw with having to, to go first. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a, it is a very difficult, is a very difficult um, issue and certainly um, so, so, so certainly, I think it's been a particular challenge for research ethics um, committee members, and especially around um, not just post mortem work, but but just the the challenges that researchers have faced on the ground. You know, with with actually obtaining consent in a in a valid way, um, and so I I, I think that. Um, I feel that within the South African context, you know, again, coming back to the issue around trust in, in researchers um, and the, the 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 respect, you know, that 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 we we, we need to have for individual autonomy, for for the, the, the patient's um, uh, understanding and the especially in the, the COVID context, the understanding of, of family members and communities with, with what is happening, you know, around research. I think waivers are difficult. Um, I think in in my experience and and certainly with what um, the 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 findings of of our research has been is that committee members um, and RECs in general tend tend to have a, a reluctance um, to to support waivers unless there is a very good justification and and I think that justification in COVID is is becoming 
harder. Um, it's it's not that that it certainly is something I don't think research ethics committees won't consider, but but the justification needs to be there. Um, and sometimes a a good um, delayed consent process um, can you know unlock many of the issues that that that, that or the concerns that that a waiver of consent might introduce. In I'm very. You know, also just to comment on on the case that that Brian mentioned and 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 their experiences. You know, it's it's very it's very difficult and and challenging to to receive a, a legal challenge to, to 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 what you are doing. And I guess my my reflection on on when you were talking around you know the issues faced and and that you you stopped the research you know on the basis of of that legal challenge is. You know that 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 bravery requires a lot of support, a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of discussion, and and in some ways, you know, a really careful view of of the risk to to benefit of of continuing with, with the research. And I think if the if the value of the research, as you highlighted, you know, so strongly outweighs, you know, one individual. Um, you know, a participant and family member being unhappy and and really understand. You know, I've listened. You know, I've 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 been involved in in consent processes. I, I understand that there's the distress around everything. Um, you know, it's it's really tough. But 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 where do we see the the value and 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 what do we do? Like, where do we see the the real benefits and and what do we need to try and push you know for um through collaboration again through improving understanding through building trust sorry i spoke a lot but it's a very complex topic thank you teresa uh, brian anything from your side yeah i mean it's it's a it's you know waivers of consent are unprecedented and, and i think um you know, I think there's a difference between unprecedented and expedient. Um, I think getting a waiver of consent because you just you want to circumvent the difficulties is, is something. Um, but I, I agree with you, Teresa, that I think the the, the indications for waivers of consent are, are, are becoming less and less as our healthcare workers are becoming vaccinated, for example. So the, you know, the exposure risk is we know what the risk to the average person, you know, um, rewind. 18 months to sort of March, April, we didn't know what the risks were going to be to healthcare workers. We didn't know really how infectious these agents were going to be. And I think we've got a much better feel for for now uh, managing that risk in terms of consent processing. Um, I think you've got to have a very good indication of of wavering of consent. There has to, you can't just do it because it's a pandemic. You have to have a good. There has to be a good. Um, a good a good argument as to why in this particular study I want to waive a consent um, and, and usually it would boil down to the risks to the patient in our particular case in cases the patients had died um, and so there was no more a vital risk in other words a risk to life um, for our particular patients and so that was one of the one of the main reasons why we did actually apply for that and, um, but I think it is becoming less and less, um, less and less important. The other thing to say is that this is not probably not going to be the last pandemic in our lifetime. If you read the, if you read the, the um, what people are saying that there, will, that there probably will be another one, maybe even two more in our in our academic lifetimes, and, and so we might sit in a situation where we have an even more infectious agent like a, 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 a shift of influenza virus, um, and we needing to get. Uh, to waivers of consent. So I think these, these important, although the the, the um, indication is decreasing currently for COVID, I think there are important discussions to have for the next time. Because I, I, unfortunately, I think there is probably going to be a next time. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Francis, you wanted to weigh in as well. Prof. Uh, I would like to weigh in. Um, I think when it comes to a waiver of consent, it all depends on the justification that is provided. And when it comes to RECs, then certainly REC members need to do an assessment of uh, the the principles of autonomy uh, versus uh, probably the principle of uh, beneficence. So if let's say uh, the REC members are happy that uh, indeed 
the benefits outweigh um, the o overriding of consent in that particular case, then certainly um, I'm sure they can actually approve that wave of consent, but it's on a case by case basis. But personally, I, mean, I think I would go for uh, delayed consent in cases where probably uh, researchers are not able to obtain consent from the participants, right, in an emergency situation like the COVID-19 emergency. Then, you know, later they should still be able to, um, to, to, to obtain delayed consent. But mm -hmm. I think for me, what matters is the justification that you provide for requesting for a waiver of consent. If the justification is adequate and then, you know, the REC members are able to, to assess uh, the benefits of, you know, um, uh, giving a waiver of consent in that particular case, then I think it, they will be able to either approve or disapprove it. The, the justification matters more uh, than anything else, I think. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Francis. Uh, thank you to the panel. Mundri, if I can see your hand up, please go ahead. Thank you to the panel and Ella, um, for uh, excellent presentations. Um, when I, my contribution to this waiver is that uh, Brian Nike, you faced the legal case against um, you now on the threat of, of that. Is that then just moves to the REC? Because the REC can also then find themselves in a legal position or for having waived. And if a committing uh, um, somebody becomes aware of it. So I do know it's very difficult for the individual researcher and uh, most probably something like looking at government support and on a higher level of council where it's for the public health interest and that you have that kind of support that, so that it's not on the individual that's fighting a one study or two study. I think in future we should make space for something like that where the where government support can come in like i do um, support you that at that stage it would have been ideal if the research could have been done exactly then not now and that it's too late now in a way so that's just my contribution to the discussion thank you very much Mindri. um I'm going to hand over to Virginia. You've, you've had your hand raised earlier and we gave you an opportunity but couldn't hear you. So Virginia, are you able to unmute and raise your question now? I am. I hope you can hear me this time. Yes, we can. Thanks. I want to um, reflect on Brian's story and I think I was a little bit involved with that and it really speaks to a community participation and a communication with families. I think this man was uh, contacted and his family was contacted by members of the case and contact tracing team um, and who who were a little alarmed and then we had heard I think via you that um, this is all interfering with their um, uh, with your research and I understand that it might have uh, appeared like that to people and so it felt like the family didn't really understand what you were doing and I think this talk speaks to <clears throat> the really difficult issue of patient communication and um, uh, over this whole time of COVID we've had bad stories between that uh, clinicians uh, could not communicate um, to the families they're too busy and we, we really need to address that issue. And I, I honestly think what you were doing now when I hear about it merits huge value. You know, we have no evidence base for what is happening to patients who die suddenly. And there's stories about uh, many, many stories like that. We need to generate that evidence base so that we can manage people better in the future. So I was, I'm just wondering whether what you said, Teresa, about having a public health approach to, re to, to research ethics really is important and could have supported this endeavor that um, perhaps uh, actually being upfront and not keeping one's research question, um, uh, uh, outside, you know, uh, confined to the research team and the ethics committee to, by saying we need to find this out. We are doing this study looking, you know, putting it in the in, in the public face um, so that people really understand what 
what the researchers are trying to establish in South Africa. So we really need to know why people are, are dying suddenly um, and th that, that we need to engage with that with communities and with the broader scientific community. Yeah, thanks very much. Sorry about not speaking <laughs> earlier. Um, may I just respond to two, two things, Kementri? I think that the, as as we ch chatted about earlier, the lack of the national body to to actually help us with these kind of decisions was a massive thing because we couldn't go out of sight of our institution to say, okay, this is actually acceptable. You may proceed with this, um, and 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 that was kind of the glass ceiling we hit. And 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 un and understandably, the ethics uh, the uh, ethics committees, the recs are, are are risk averse. You know, they don't want to be seen as 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 particularly in the framework that we talked about. Um, with the mistrust of science and institutions, um, they didn't want to be seen to 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 be going against the individual rights. Um, the, just in, in terms of family communication, I agree with you. That's absolutely key. And something you know, you must understand uh, two things. We, we actually did approach, as far as I remember, some of the high ups in the national body, but everybody was very involved at that stage with. Um, setting up logistics and the physical infrastructure too much so that they couldn't actually give this kind of thing airtime. Um, understandably so, which is why you have to prepare these things in advance. And this is why I think the British have done so well in their preparation of research in advance to this COVID wave after the SARS waves, etc. The first SARS waves. And, and in terms of communications with family, what we had, what we did after that, and not because of this, but just because we were not able to meet the emotional needs of patients and families as clinicians on the call base, we drew alongside our um, our psychology and psychiatry department, and we actually asked them if they could um, take on the role of family liaison, which has worked brilliantly. And you've probably seen some information on that in the press. So thank you very much, Brian and Teresa, for weighing in there. Uh, uh, Dr. Nair, you have a question. I'm going to allow you to ask your question now, and then we'll go back to the panel. Thank you, Professor Murli. Um, So actually, I think both Brian and Virginia have addressed my question. I really wanted to know uh, whether there was any room for proxy consent when you knew the prognosis was very poor, but I think that question has been answered. But I do have a comment about, and I think Brian already mentioned this, that how do we prepare for, um, for future pandemics? And is it something that research ethics committees should be considering now and putting in place SOPs regarding waiver of consent and also issues around um, reimbursement as uh, Francis brought this up in his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Francis, you can take it up from there. Thanks, Thanks Prof. Um, I think it is important for RECs to be prepared for these pandemics. And uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, a waiver of consent, certainly I think we need to have uh, SOPs that are talking about, you know, a waiver of consent, uh, especially in emergency situations. Those should be in place. And again, um, the issue of uh, participant um, compensation, it's also very important, especially um, in countries which have been hit by the pandemic, because uh, what happens is that when the pandemic hits, then sometimes, you know, the, 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 the prices of goods and services go up. And so if, let's say, you had planned to give your participants uh, 20, let's say, let's say 50 rand uh, per visit for transport, then certainly when the prices of uh, the fares of uh, transportation go up, go up, then certainly you would want to make sure that uh, participants are reimbursed uh, appropriately for transport expenses. So I think what's important is that each each rec needs to come up with uh, some SOPs as to you know how they should deal with issues of uh, uh, waiver of consent and then during emergencies and then the issue of uh, uh, compensation for research participants during emergencies in case uh, you know something happens then suddenly they need they need there's need uh, to have those SOPs in place. Okay so uh, Tiwonge. All right, thank you so much. I just wanted to comment on the issue of waiver of consent, just like uh, Francis presented. Uh, basically, what we learned from the data that we collected from Malawi is that 
most respondent used to refer to the constitution of Malawi. Because in the constitution it's written, no one should be subjected to scientific experiments without consent. So they are strictly following that. But we know that the research guidelines, they also provide the waiver of consent, but uh, the justification mostly it's when you are dealing with cluster randomized trials. But when you're doing random, individual randomized trials, the justification were becoming very difficult. And uh, that's why this uh, wave of consent was coming out during the COVID-19. That's what I wanted to comment. Thank you. Thank you, Tiwonge. Teresa, you can go next. Um, th thanks so much. Um, I, I just wanted to, to come back to the, the point that Brian and, and Virginia um, both made um, uh, around the, the consent process. You know, I think the, the one learning from, you know, post-mortem non-COVID, post-mortem research um, is that the, the consent process, um, you know, generally is sensitive, you know, anyway. And, and I think that, um, you know, perhaps as a reflection for RECs, you know, may, maybe for us to sort of to, to think about is that maybe, you know, especially for, for post-mortem research in COVID-19, having seen the value, we need to reflect as, as ethics committees how we can broaden that, that consent process to include, you know, aspects of psychological support, uh, grief counselling, you know, really uh, and, and potentially you know, having a consent process where, you know, that the conversation, you know, takes place over, you know, a number of days that the, that, that there's actually an investment in in really ensuring that the participants do understand, you know, and 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 have a have a sense of why the research is important and 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 aspects that have been done, uh, what has been done to protect the the dignity, you know, of the the, the, the deceased um, loved one. So so I think that 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 is you know such an important aspect and and. It comes back, you know, again to, to communication. I think the, the second aspect is um, the, the pressures of time, um, you know, and, and Virginia, I, I think your, your points are, are excellent um, around, you know, community engagement, uh, sufficient stakeholder engagement, which, you know, are core ethical principles that should definitely be embedded in research during pu public health emergencies. I think that, the, you know, and, and certainly like if we're moving towards, you know, best practice, we, we have to unpack that further and understand how we can really get authentic stakeholder engagement to support um, the, the, the nature of, of, of research that, that we are doing. Because, you know, as in, I can remember quite clearly what one of my, my participants, you know, in, in my research mentioned, how do you achieve that? You know, do, do you just take seven people and the number was random, you know, off the streets and, and say that these people are forming a, a community. It's it's very difficult in, in a pandemic to just, you know, actually define who the community is and how we get, you know, good representation of views. And do we need to consider maybe, you know, crowdsourcing approaches um, to actually really, you know, getting a, a good authentic sense of what broader communities think rather than our traditional approaches to, you um, uh, community advisory boards, etc. Um, I agree that collaboration is, is critical. Um, and again, collaboration takes time. Brian mentioned again that the pressures, you know, that, that researchers are under in terms of, you know, funding, um, the publication pressures that we face as academics. And I think, you know, as again, as we move forward, we, we have to have these discussions about, you know, you know, that those tough ethical decisions, like how can you be brave and, you know, maybe, you know, prioritize like, like which, 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 which do you value? Which is, which is most important, you know, really building an authentic, you know, public health ethics approach, you know, or potentially, you know, having to bend a little bit to pressure and how do we, how do we meet in the middle? My last point um, is just that the, NHRIC is working on um, pandemic um, ethics guidelines. Um, they've actually um, sent the, the guidelines, the draft guidelines out for, for experts and um, consultation. So I just wanted to, to reassure that there, there is, you know, um, an attempt, you know, from the NHRIC to, to really provide guidance on, on the, the, those critical issues that, that Lulu referred to. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Teresa. And so, Minri, I see your hand is up again. Please continue with your question. Thank you. I hear I hear reference the whole time to to Rex that should make decision and has have SOPs in place. What what the concern is in that we noted in the in the past months. What that that RECs are following sometimes risky practices as well in the way in what they did with electronic signatures and things like that. And that I really want to say and what I said in the beginning, and we I know that we had no council, but and, and like in other countries, but that governing bodies uh, should really take on um, clear standards and norm for pan pandemics and take on this responsibility. And Teresa, I'm glad to hear that this is happening, but um, because there is, and it happened in this last few um, year and a half, that certain RICs take decisions that's really not based or um, that, that protects them and that's risky decisions on informed consent. And that we must also prevent that we have a lot of individual RICs doing their own thing um, and, and, and not following at least some guidelines for a country. So uh, thank you, Minri. What is interesting is that we have a National Health Research Ethics Council that was not visible during the pandemic. We had outdated guidelines issued by that same council that did not pay adequate attention to uh, ethical issues that arise during pandemics. And since the National Health Research Ethics Council has been reconstituted, uh, we're still in a pandemic. We hope that those guidelines will be released soon. So is there anyone from NHREC who can comment on how soon those pandemic guidelines will be released? So that important research like Brian just described cannot be wasted. And, and you know, as a result of this type of research not being able to continue, we can see the impact. We can see people still dying in ICU. And surely research ethics committees need to take that into account. You know, what level of harm are research ethics committees causing by being so conservative in terms of their decision making that patients actually die because of their decision making? So so at that level, uh, can can we take any comments? Francis, is your hand still up or is this an old hand? Uh. Prof, uh, my hand is up. Um, I wanted to comment on what Minria said. Um, so my comment is that, you know, in some countries, and for example, I mean, let me talk about Malawi. We have a regulatory authority that is not functional. And uh, in those cases where the regulatory authority is not functional, is not able to provide guidance to RECs, then RECs have actually started uh, taking some of these issues upon themselves and then coming up with some guidelines and some standard operating procedures uh, that uh, you know they can use uh, when there are emergencies like this. And that's why in my presentation, I talked about the different RECs in Malawi developing their own guidance uh, for their researchers. This is because we don't have any um, national guidance from the regulator authority. And that's why you know my comment on uh, development of these SOPs was based on the fact that, uh, for example, in Malawi, we don't have actually a functional uh, regulator or body, uh, authority. And uh, certainly, I think in those cases, I don't think there's anything wrong for uh, a REC to come up with some standard operating procedures that should actually uh, support the decisions that they make. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. So, uh, Teresa, you raised a very important point around RECs being married to the Emanuel framework. And this was developed, I mean, this, firstly, Emanuel is an American. It was developed years ago. It was developed long pre-COVID and was based very much on the individual autonomy model. So should we still be using this type of approach in the midst of a pandemic when a public health ethics approach is more important? Uh, Teresa, do you wanna say a little bit more about that? How can we encourage research ethics committees to transition over to a public health ethics approach so that they make more appropriate decisions 
for the situation that they are faced with? So um, thanks. I, I I completely you know agree with your with your comments around the Emmanuel framework. I mean, and and it's, I think, in you know as the 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 Department of Health you know ethics uh, guidelines reference health research, you know, health research has such a broad definition, and yet some of the Emmanuel principles are only very very applicable to to to, to very specific kind of clinical research and. And certainly, you know, issues of relational autonomy, um, solidarity, reciprocity, and importantly, social justice are, are not really, or well, in fact, are not considered um, by by the Emmanuel framework. So I think, um, you know, again, just just reflecting on 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 the work we we have done, um, you know, I think that that it, it becomes a case of, you know, do 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 you toss the baby out with, with the bathwater? I, I don't think a, a complete abandonment of of the Emmanuel sort of core principles um, is is warranted. I think I think the principles of, um, you know, really respect for for autonomy, you know, as we've all been sort of discussing around around consent. I think it, you know, really is a core principle. Um, so to um, you know, evaluating risk benefits, but but I think if if perhaps a, a more balanced approach um could could be achieved, I think that um it it would allow us to to potentially be a little bit more responsive um to some of of the critical issues that that researchers are, are seeing on 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 the ground, um so 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 so, so that that would would be my view. I'm interested to hear what what other colleagues think. Anyone else with views on public health ethics and how we can take those principles in? Because, you know, to be stuck on autonomy using an old framework is a real problem when a public health ethics approach has a principle that re requires limiting autonomy. So we're moving, you know, across a spectrum of different principles. How do we do that? Mark, please go ahead. Yeah, so, so, so I think it's a very important question. And I think the thing that we got wrong in South Africa is that we didn't develop an appropriate solidarity response. I think that uh, we can talk about the NHRC not being available, but I think the fundamental error was that we didn't have one um, protocol or one or two protocols, one or two aims within the whole country where people collaborated. And, and, I, and, and I'd like to, um, I, I think we should all be accountable for that. Um, I think that the researchers, the, the very highly regarded researchers that put protocols in, needed to be more accountable in terms of um, uh, where we were going as a country. And then I think what could have happened is that we could have then had a very strong conversation around public health ethics. The idea that we may trump the liberties of um, of, uh, of Mr. Individual and Mrs. Individual and Miss Individual, we could have had that conversation in a more broadly, a more broad based. And I think it gets down to um, why research is why research is, is is done, and the issues around profiteering. And I think uh, what's what may have been is that people got on the bandwagon, found a gap, and wanted to be the first to publish, and the first to find out what was happening from a pathophysiological point of view and get it out there. And that's why there was so much pre-printing. So I think the lessons for me going forward would be that. Um, that, uh, that as we move into um, continuing of the, of the pandemic, can the investigators, the strong collaborators get together and think it through in terms of how we could move as a, as a country to have uh, similar protocols thought through by all the ethics committees and agreed to by Mr. and Mrs. Public in terms of how their, how their rights would be trumped and, 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 and look to see if we could share the, the, the spoils that are clinically benefit and show clinical utility. And I think that's one lesson for uh, the, re the researchers. And I think we've got to do better as, as ethics committees to collaborate. We tried with RESCOP. It seems to me that there have been gaps because certain research may have been held very tightly by, um, by researchers and, and, weren't, and there wasn't the ability to actually share them on, on, a, on a bigger platform. And maybe we as ethics committee chairs need to have a, a need to share more about some of the more controversial issues without killing con uh, confidentiality of protocols, but finding a way that we can open up that that uh, that uh, that, collabor that collaboration. And uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll stop there. there. 
Thank you very much, Mark. I mean, you've raised so many important points. So having a researcher group, you know, come together, um, you know, Brian, I'm sure, you know, you have colleagues who are working in this in a similar field as you, who had similar challenges to you at other institutions where, you know, if you guys could put a group together and brainstorm the challenges and give some input into research ethics committees. So we, we often talk about community engagement in research. This is almost the research ethics committee community engaging with the researcher community at a high level and taking the, the feedback from the researcher community back into guideline development. I think that's an obligation of the of research ethics committees and the National Health Research Ethics Council as they move forward with their guideline update. So Brian, can uh, can you give us some input from your side on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, absolutely, you know, it, it, it's, I think it's, it's really needed to. And, and I think increasingly there has been communication. And, I, I, you know, I had a number of, uh, have, a, have a lovely relationship with RHREC and, and often we just pick up the phone and phone them. And, 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 and I think that's, that, that is, has over the years has definitely become more from a researcher point of view much more possible rather than an us and a them thing the researchers and the HREC communities and almost like a conversation more than an application if that makes sense um, and I think that we, when I've had those interactions I found them incredibly useful because you don't always understand as a researcher what is going down behind closed doors you're not privy to sitting in on those meetings which would actually I, at times I have asked to be able to sit in on meetings when my when my protocols have been uh, presented so that I can actually see what the discussions are for the next time. Mark makes a very good point about um, profiteering, um, academic profiteering from a crisis. And, and I think that is, is, is a very important point. Um, you know, are people just publishing for the set, you know, every all the other research avenues were came to a close and were put on hold. And so people had to find something else to publish on. And it becomes a bit of a bun fight, I think. And I think you've got to be you've got to be careful of that. And I totally concede that. Um, the reason I put up my hand is actually to to um, to ask the questions: Well, should these discussions about uh, the, 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 these approaches to to pandemics, etc., actually be broadened to tuberculosis? Because I just checked the numbers now while we've been online. They've been in the last eighteen months. There've been eight thousand. 85,468 deaths in South Africa from COVID-19. Okay, that's in what, call it 18 months, maybe a bit more. Um, 2.87 million cases. Now, we have 89,000 deaths from TB every single year. And is TB just a pandemic we become accustomed to? So should we, in terms of the public health interest, should we, should we, can I just put on the table, ask the question, is should we be thinking about TB in the same way or is it because it's, it's kind of um, a more chronic disease that the same ethical principles don't maybe need to apply as to pandemics that we've been had? Just, just something that, that struck me. Um, is that there's another pandemic that we're dealing with, which kind of is no longer a pan, no longer prioritised in our on our continent because um, it just doesn't it's we become so used to it. Your committee reviews lots of research, uh, Mark, on in terms of TB as well. Teresa and Mark, is there anything you'd like to say in terms of approaches to TB research, given that it is almost a parallel pandemic? Um, so I'm not sure if, if Mark would like to go first or. Um, but perhaps um, just, to, just, to, just to concur with, with, with what Brian has said, I think that the, the difficulties we are going to face going forward are really going to be around um, you know, establishing clear priorities in, in terms of, of research as well as research ethics. Um, and, and, you know, as, as, as everyone has said, you know, I think collaboration around those um, is critically important um, go, going forward. But, but, but certainly, I think, you know, you know we, we keep on talking, uh, well, everyone refers to the new normal. You know, well, the new normal is we, we're probably going to have to live with this, you know, COVID pandemic, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, Brian made reference to the fact that we are likely to have, you know, an, a different pandemic, you know, 
later in the future and 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 yes you know you sh 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 should our should our view be be so forward looking that we only focused on what is new what is different what is a real threat and perceived as a real threat you know or you know sh should we should we look at our context more more carefully um i think you know that there, there's so many factors co contributing to our focus on on covert research you know which have been alluded to already but but certainly you know from a social justice point of view and from a you know health inequity and um, you know structural injustice that, that, that exist in our society, I, I, com I completely agree that a, a public health ethics approach towards um, TB and, you know, other other diseases and and research with, within within the, the South African and the African context and even globally, you know, is is really important. Um, and for, for me, I think, you know, even you know, adopting a, a bit of a, a global health ethics lens, you know, in, in frameworks that, that we develop is going to be critical to to advancing um, health, to advancing research and to reducing inequities um, go, go, going forward. I mean, we've seen, you know, the global inequities play out, you know, on, within our day-to-day our -day lives. And, and I think that it's something that, that, that we can no longer ignore. So yes, I think frameworks should absolutely be, be responsive, responsive. They should, should be inclusive and not just, um, you know, what is seen as a, what is being labeled as a, as a pandemic. Thank you, Teresa. Francis? Francis, I see your hand up. Yes, Prof. Um, I wanted actually to comment on the need to make sure that our research ethics guidelines should incorporate some public health ethics uh, into to them. I mean, because most of the guidelines that we are using for doing research have been developed from the traditional research ethics, where they, they always talk about the issue of, you know, the principles of ethics, like, you know, autonomy and all that. But when it comes to public health emergencies, I mean, we certainly need to think about the common good. We certainly need to consider the public health, uh, ethics principles. And so um, what I want to recommend is that, uh, you know, regulatory bodies like the National Health Research Ethics Council and, you know, even our own regulatory authority here, we, they certainly need to develop specific um, uh, ethics guidelines for conducting research in emergency situations where they should actually uh, include or rather consider the public health uh, ethics principles uh, so that at least, uh, you know, when there are emergencies, at least uh, researchers know or research ethics committees know which uh, guidelines they should use other than just using the traditional uh, research ethic guidelines that are there that are more individualistic uh, than, you know, talking about um, populations. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Dr. Lynn Horn, I see your hand, and then Mark after that, please. Um, hi, Kamantri. Yes, thanks for giving me an opportunity um, to say just something, just to sort of round off this discussion. I think if we think back to when the, the NREC was first established and when we got our first set of guidelines, I think they were rightly very protectionist. We were focusing on the individual. And I think this discussion just shows a level of maturity, if you like, in research ethics in a South African context that we are now actually migrating to perhaps be able to incorporate um, some of the principles around public health ethics, like in the Nuffield framework, those values of stewardship, solidarity, solidarity reciprocity, et cetera. Um, so I think it's it's an exciting conversation um, and, I, and I hope to see that it will be taken further. Thanks, that's all I wanted to say. I hope also that when the guidelines are being updated, that we are going to see very specifically, you know, the public health ethics principles laid out in the guidelines so that they become common knowledge. Mark? Yes, yeah, so I was agreeing with, with Lynn uh, wholeheartedly and, and very well put. And the other issue, it does talk again to a national process. We need to, do, if we are going to operate and prioritize in, in a res research in a certain manner, as as um, be it HIV, TB, be it diabetes, the you know the the, the colliding uh, uh, clinical case scenarios which are causing huge harm. 
I think it should be prioritized at a national level. L like we had issues with microbicides when we, there were problems with microbicides, we need to get together with the role players and say, right, this is how we think our thinking are as ethics committees. This is what the National Research Council are thinking about in terms of priority setting. And this is what the NHREC say and, and try and get these together and have an open discussion around where, where we are. And it gets down to funding. That's the one aspect that nobody's spoken about. The funding dictates the, the, the agenda. And what's happened now is that the funding has been all pushed into the, into the COVID space. We've got to find a way to ethically unlock that and suggest that that at the moment now, 18 months down the line, is, 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 is important, but not completely appropriate. And how do we now take that funding back in? And we're all going to need help to actually do that because the funding actually, that's the elephant in the room. It's the funding which actually dictates in a resource per environment like ourselves, the, the agenda of these of, of big of big research uh, protocols. And, and are we able to have those mature discussions to uh, make sure funding uh, goes in the right direction? Over, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Teresa? Um, thank you. I just wanted to um, support what, what, what Mark has said um, and just around the, the pace at which the NHRA can can deal with, you know, these these very important changes that, that need to be made, made to the guidelines. Yeah, I, I really feel that the RAC should advocate for the better, the improved resourcing of the of the NHRA. I mean, the fact that we were, were without an NHRA for, you know, a year, basically, you know, speaks very much to, to how, well, I think, speaks very much to how research ethics is, is viewed, um, the prioritization that is placed um, on research ethics. Um, and and uh, maybe just to add that, you know, most of the colleagues on the NHREC are fully employed in other positions, you know, doing the work of the NHREC very much over and above their, their normal responsibilities. So it speaks to funding, it speaks to resourcing, and if we see these as priorities, there needs to be a push um, to, to, to better resource um, the national level, the level committee um, in terms of time and, of course, funding. Okay. Thank you very much, Teresa. I thank you to the panel for an excellent session for outstanding presentations and a stimulating discussion. Thank you to all participants in the session. It was really wonderful. I think we have a few important take home messages. Number one, we need to ensure that we bring the researcher community closer to the research ethics community in terms of engagement and that there is, you know, uh, optimal exchange of ideas and information so that we have better guidelines. I also think in terms of looking at guideline development, there are several members on this panel who serve on NHREC and there are many messages that need to go back to NHREC from this session relating to guidance development, funding sources, um, you know, ensuring that we have robust guidelines starting yesterday to ensure that pandemic type research can be facilitated. Uh, we should never reach the situation where research ethics committees are blocking research. And in many cases, this happened during the pandemic. This should never be repeated. So going forward, we need to ensure that we have robust guidelines with adequate flexibility, taking into account public health ethics principles so that we can move forward and enable research rather than obstruct it. Thank you very much to everyone. For those who are joining us this afternoon, we will reconvene at two o'clock. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Kim Bye-bye. You're welcome, Brian. Thank you so much. Thanks, okay, Teresa. Bye -bye. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Francis Thank and Tiwonge. Thank you.